Greetings, everyone. My name is Ruth Mitchell. With today's rising prices and declining margins putting the squeeze on distributors, implementing best practices for managing inventory are more crucial than ever to a distributor's success. Growing your business requires eliminating costs from the supply channel and streamlining processes. Again, I'm Ruth Mitchell, editor of The Wholesaler Magazine, and I'll be your moderator today. Today, our presenters are from Epicor Software, Justin Ward, Product Manager for Eclipse, and Tony Corley, Senior Manager, Product Marketing. They will discuss ways to maximize your inventory optimization, including tactics such as advanced demand forecasting, static versus dynamic replenishment method, central warehousing, wireless warehouse, and dealing with unproductive inventory. Tony, I've heard the term advanced demand forecasting. What does that actually really mean to a distributor? Ruth, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Let, let me start, though, by kind of explaining what forecasting is. Because often when we're showing people our software or working with distributors, some people kind of jump ahead and think about how you generate a purchase order or automatic replenishment. So really forecasting to begin with is, I think of it like the weather, right? It's like watching the news, watching the weather forecast, you're trying to predict the weather. So forecasting is trying to predict how much of a given item you're going to sell over any given time period. And there's lots of ways to get at that. Uh, some people will tell me they use they use a three-month average, they use a six-month average, they use a 12-month average. But what they're really doing is they're really taking numbers from the past and coming up with an average. That isn't necessarily what you're going to sell the item going forward, right? Um, and I always use this example. Um, if we think about my weight, um, if we were to take my average weight, right, we looked at my weight over the last couple months, which is, oddly enough, 215, uh, 217, and 219. Uh, you might think, well, what's Tony going to be next month? You'll think maybe he's going to be 221 in October and 223, so on and so forth. But I'm actually seasonal. Unlike most people where they lose weight in the um, certain times of the year, I actually lose weight in the winter because I like to work out in the winter. So what will actually happen is uh, I'll start losing weight as the winter goes on. So I'm actually going to probably, hopefully, be 213, 211, 209 in the future. And the only way to know that would be looking at two years of my weight history. And the reason why I mention that is that's kind of what advanced demand forecasting is. So if we look at any given item sales numbers and they're trending up or trending down, that information is great, but it's only relevant if we look at the information from last year or the year before and look at that. So if you've got seasonal items, you know, if they're trending down, but the season's about to begin next month, you need to know that information. So that kind of leads me to what advanced demand forecasting is. You know, advanced demand forecasting is a tool that looks at your inventory items and defines or finds the best fit formula. So it'll determine whether a three-month average, a six-month average, a nine-month average, uh, whether it's trending up, trending down, whether it's a weighted average, whether it's a seasonal average. It'll factor all that in. Essentially, every month it's going to compare the actual usage with the forecast and look for any deviation. If there's a deviation, it'll go out and find other formulas and figure out what's the best formula. And really the best part of it is uh, with our systems, the buyers don't have to manually do that. The system will run through all the SKUs, come back to you and say, hey, I found these items where I think the current demand pattern is wrong. You might want to look deeper at those items. So that's what advanced demand forecasting is. Thank you. Justin, how does Epicor software advanced demand forecasting? How does it support Hi, Ruth. it? It, it um, as Tony mentioned, the um, computers are, are great at crunching numbers. So looking at years of history of individual items that a distributor sells, uh, and there's thousands of transactions across tens of thousands of SKUs, a computer can apply mathematical and statistical models to analyze that and identify those patterns like Tony brought out with his weight on an item by item basis. And so an individual doesn't need to do that. The computer can do that. 
And so um, Epicor software has uh, algorithms. Um, some of them uh, have fancy names like Holt and Holt Winters uh, and exponential smoothing. And these are just statistical models like predicting the weather that have been proven over time to accurately predict in certain conditions whether an item is seasonal, uh, trending up, trending down, and accounting for things like um, exceptional sales if there's a spike or a random variant um, that the, the statistical algorithm can account for that and determine what the future demand for that item uh, is likely to be. And uh, a computer and Epicor software can, can analyze each product and go through and analyze it through all of these models. And you can think about the recent hurricane that, that Hurricane Lane that came by uh, Hawaii and you look at some of the, the pictures and they would have all the different models with their different paths that that hurricane would follow. It's a similar um, uh, thing with, with purchasing and analyzing demand of items and you can statistically say okay based on where this individual item actually went what the sale uh, sales were the particular statistical model can say this is the best one that's that best fit so again the computer can arrive at that decision uh, and suggest that to the buyer thank you uh, let's talk about dynamic versus static replenishment methods. Tony, um, can you explain um, how dynamic replenishment differs from a static replenishment method, and how would a distributor determine which method to use? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Uh, great question. Um, to me, it, you know, it, it really starts to redefine the difference between um, manual and self-adjusting replenishment or dynamic and static. So. If you think about static replenishment, it's it's the old min-max, right? It's it's something that the buyer set manually. Um, so you manually set a min, you manually set a max, and every time you go to buy, the system's using that math to figure it out. What dynamic replenishment is, is something, I'll use the word self-adjusting, that you, instead of setting it up for a set number, say a minimum of 20, you're telling the system to keep me X number of days supply, and I'll get to what that means in a second but you're really setting something that's going to adjust automatically. So as any of the variables change, like we mentioned before, advanced demand forecasting, if the forecast for an item goes up or a forecast for an item goes down or the lead time of the item goes up or down, or you wanna change how much safety stock, then your replenishment numbers change automatically. Uh, we get a little bit deeper into that. You know, if we think about the first part of that, either order point or minimum, um, to me, they're not necessarily a quantity. It's something I learned from a buyer when I started back in 1993. What he taught me was that really the order point and minimum are really when to buy. It's a point in time when you're going to physically buy the item. So on a min, you know, you're manually setting that. And, and that works fine. And we typically see that when the buyer first gets an item, they have no history. There's no other item like it. So they manually set the minimum, right, which works fine. And what they typically do is they set a plan that says, you know, over time, I'm going to come back and look at this item and change them in later on. What happens a lot of times is the, the buyer's really busy, doesn't have the time to go back to that. They're pulled in 37 different directions. They don't have great tools to manage it, and they don't get around to changing that. Uh, that causes problems. Uh, for instance, it causes you stock outs if your minimum's too low. Again, I use a personal example. My son just went back to college, but he drinks about a gallon of milk a day when he comes home in the summer. I forget he's coming home, right? So my demand of milk changes dramatically. I go from about a gallon a week to seven gallons a week. I have stockouts all summer long. It takes me a couple weeks to figure that out, and I start stocking up. Now he's going back to school. The other day I went and bought seven gallons of milk, so I'm stocked up for, you know, the next seven weeks on milk. Some will probably, you know, become obsolete over time. That's going to be min. The, the flip side of that, the dynamic method would be order point. Order point's a mathematical calculation of what that min is. It's a combination of your average daily usage, and that's going back to the forecast, right? So most systems will give you a forecast on a given time period, say monthly, but then that's broken down to a daily usage. You'll take your average daily usage and multiply that by your lead time, which is how long it takes for the item to get in. You'll factor in your review cycle, which is how long it takes for you to buy or how often you buy from that vendor. Maybe you buy every two weeks, and then you add in your safety stock. 
So think of the order point as just a mathematically calculated minimal. Uh, the, the other point of that is when you think about how much to buy, right? So when I went to the store, I decided to buy seven gallons of milk. There's lots of different maths for that, but the static method would be a max. You manually set the max. You know, I want to go in every buy up to three gallons. Or you can use a dynamic method. Multiple formulas out there. You can use AOQ. I'd explain the formula, but it involves a square root, so I don't fully understand the math of it. But it's a, a proven formula for calculating the economic order quantity. And what it's doing is it's balancing the cost to carry the inventory with the cost to purchase. And what I always explain it simply is, you know, if Justin and I decided that we wanted to go out and start a distributor. We could buy everything we needed for the entire year on January 1st. We could. We need a huge warehouse and a big pile of money and a crystal ball. But we could do it. After the first year, we could say, you know, we have a ton of excess inventory. Let's buy what we need for any given day. You could do that also, just one day at a time. Neither of them is probably right. There's some economic order quantity where it makes sense to buy from a vendor on a regular cycle, maybe every two weeks, maybe every four weeks, some cycle like that. That's what EOQ gets you to. There's other formulas out there for that. There's line point. There's order up to. But all those methods are a mathematically calculated um, amount to buy. Thank you. Uh, Justin, what are your thoughts on this? Well, just building on what uh, Tony was explaining, and again, similar to the demand, this is where computers and, and software can uh, aid the buyer um, in making decisions about how much to buy and when to buy and using those um, dynamic and calculated uh, timeframes that incorporate safety stock and um, uh, lead time and, and order cycle, so how regularly you order that from that particular supplier, how long it takes for that inventory to get here uh, to, your, to your location to satisfy any demand that you have. And they're even uh, more complicated or, or more sophisticated uh, scenarios where software can again benefit that buyer making that decision when vendors and suppliers have incentives to buy uh, additional inventory. So, um, you know, the order points and line points in certain conditions uh, might be providing a certain number, but if the buyer, uh, sorry, the vendor has a promotion that says, well, if you buy an extra quantity, I'll give you a discount. And uh, again, software can kind of help uh, by adding a, a tool for the, the uh, the buyer to determine what the return on their additional investment is, or would it make sense to go ahead and take advantage of that promo? Um, you know, you use software to uh, help make that decision. Got it. Uh, let's talk about unproductive inventory. And Tony, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what are the best practices for dealing with unproductive inventory? And are you referring to inventory that doesn't sell, or is there more to knowing what your unproductive inventory is? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Uh, I like to think uh, of unproductive inventory is really in really four distinct categories. I like to think about dead inventory, dying or mostly dead inventory, overstock, and then I'll, a big lump sum I'll call otherwise unproductive. So, you know, let me start with dead inventory. You know, and we, if we had 100 buyers or 100 purchasing agents in the room, we could have 100 different opinions on what dead inventory is. It's typically inventory with no sales in X number of months. And the X is where we would get a, a different number from each buyer, right? And I, I don't know what that number is. I've seen people say no item, no sales in three months, no sales in six months, no sales in nine months. Uh, the one concern with using, say, three months is, you could have a seasonal item where, sure, you haven't sold anything in three months, but it's going to be coming up in a couple months. So maybe three months is too short. Maybe 12 months is too long, right, because there's a whole concept that if you don't address it, and while it, when it first becomes dead, it's hard to fix it. So I think each buyer can have a, you know, a different way of treating that what's dead inventory. Uh, but how do, you know, how do you deal with dead inventory? It's a tough thing to do, right? A lot of people will tell you you need to get rid of it as fast as possible, you know, unless, of course, your market is obsolete inventory, right? There's a whole school of thought, and there are distributors out there who buy obsolete inventory from other distributors. Their whole go-to-market strategy is buy this obsolete inventory, have tons of it available when you need it, 
and charge you dramatically more than you sold it to them in the past. But unless that's, unless that's your model, most people will say you need to get rid of dead stock as quickly as possible. The way we've seen a lot of our customers do that is come up with um, creative ways to sell it. They'll provide a searchable list for their salespeople. So when, a, when you're in an order for a customer, you can search the dead inventory, see what's out there. Customer bought something similar. You can even be proactive if your software has tools to show you which items have bought that item in the past. You might do a marketing campaign or a mailer. You know, I could market to Justin that you bought this item six months ago. Would you like some more? We have this much left. Another big thing I've seen distributors do is putting some type of spiff. So if you pay your inside or outside commission, pay them a higher commission on those dead items. You're really incenting them to get rid of those items uh, faster, right? You're paying them a little more for that. So that's going to be dead. Um, dying, or what I consider mostly dead, is a little bit of a different category. Um, I consider that items you're still selling, but they're trending down, right? And the key for me on dying inventory is finding them before they become dead, right? You, once they become dead, the market's moved on from them and it's tough to sell. You got to find it while that trend is going down. And that can be difficult, right? Because it could be a seasonal item, right? So whenever you get that, an item could be dying. Look at the sales last year, maybe did the same things last year and came back. Um, so how would you deal with dying inventory? You know, the first thing is determine why. Because unlike dead inventory, um, there could be other reasons. Like one of the reasons could be the price. Maybe your price is too high in the market, so your sales are going down. And, you know, affect that. Do some price shopping to see maybe adjusting the price will fix it. Uh, if it's the product, you know, the market's moved on. Uh, then the other thing to look at is maybe the number of customers. Most systems will tell you the distinct number of customers buying that. And the school of thought is the more customers buying the item, the less risky it is. But if you only have a handful of items, or I'm sorry, a handful of customers still buying that item, then it's probably a very risky item, right? Because one more customer decides to stop buying it, then the demand's going to go down uh, dramatically. Uh, so ways of dealing with that, you know, again, reach out to those customers, see what their plans are long term. You can't do that for all your SKUs to talk to customers, but if it's a handful of items that are dying, you can. You know, another thing I've seen people do is treat that like a non-stock or special item where you're not going to stock it for someone, but you'll special order it if they need it. So you're still going to provide it for them, but you're not going to maintain that quantity on the shelf. If I keep going, right, we talked about dead and dying. I think of a third category called overstock. And overstock is just an item, you have too much of it, right? And there's lots of reasons. I've seen sometimes it's an item we mentioned earlier, the min max. You may have an item where you set the min and max originally, and all of a sudden the demand went down, and it's consistent, but it's just lower than you thought. Now you just have too much of that on the shelf, right? Another example I've seen is if your system doesn't recommend for you to buy to a minimum purchase quantity. So the vendor tells you you need to cut a $2,000 PO to make minimum. You come up with $1,500. You're trying to find that last $500. If your system doesn't help you get to that, I've seen buyers do a, a real easy thing is they buy a lot more of their A items, and they do that, do that on a regular basis. So at the end of a year, you might have 12 months, 18 months supply of an A item which isn't the end of the world, but now you're overstocked of that. Uh, ways to deal with that, um, with um, overstock, it's just trying to figure out how you got to that point again, right? Did you get there because your mins and maxes are wrong, or did you get there because demand shifted? Uh, the last category we'll talk about, you know, otherwise unproductive. And the, the, the interesting thing to get to the otherwise unproductive is what metric you use. A lot of buyers will use turns. Uh, turns is a, is a very good metric. You know, it's telling you how many times you turn the inventory. The only problem with turns is it doesn't factor in the gross margin you made. So I like either turn and earn or gross margin return on investment. And both of those metrics will factor in the margin you made or how much you earned on that. So you're really balancing how often you turned an item with the margin you made. And what you're looking for is something that has a low turn and earn or low GMROI. And the in, again, like the other examples, the things of dealing with that because now you're, you're kind of putting two factors in, ways you can deal with that is just, you know, lowering your average inventory. Maybe you just have too much of it, or maybe you can increase the gross margin the rate to raise the otherwise unproductive item out of that category. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Justin, what are your thoughts on this? Well, Tommy did a great job of kind of setting the stage for uh, unproductive inventory and I think software can help, and many software applications help provide a report of what these items are, you know, finding them and finding them early. 
uh, if you haven't sold it within a year or uh, 180 days, um, evaluate that and make a decision if this particular item is uh, at risk or it is in fact dead or dying and I need to take some action. Um, I think oftentimes what becomes a, a challenge for the distributor is that is in a report or they get a list that they can kind of go through, whereas that that next action, like actually getting rid of the inventory, either sending it back to your supplier or adjusting it out if you're physically going to eliminate the inventory, or doing those things like creating uh, uh, a commission uh, incentive for your salespeople and making sure that shows up in sales order entry so they're encouraged to, to sell that particular item or you're going to provide a discount. Um, making that part of the software application to help you uh, deal with that unproductive inventory rather than just know what it is. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about central warehousing. Um, Justin, I'll start with you on this one. Um, why would a distributor with multiple branches need central warehousing? The uh, thanks, Ruth. The, the central warehousing capability uh, provides a a lot of of benefits. Um, if you have, some people call it like a hub and spoke. Some people call it, uh, uh, you know, satellite branches with a distribution center. Um, the the acquisition costs, so we've been talking about uh, how much you should buy, when you should buy, bringing that inventory into a single location rather than having to have purchase orders supply all of your, your multiple locations. You can save money that way. Uh, certainly uh, volumes and, and overall stock of inventory can be uh, shared. So safety stock is a perfect example. Um, you can share the uh, safety stock quantity for all your distributed locations by storing that in one central warehouse. There's um, just a, a, a lot of efficiency in serving a geographical region of, with a central DC and distributed branches. You can reduce your storage costs. Um, so by having one larger distribution center uh, that uh, can spread out the cost of maintaining all of that inventory Rather than having to, to stock it at all the local branches, you can condense that and, and reduce your overall storage costs. So again, the, the, there's reduced acquiring costs, there's reduced uh, storage costs, and you can increase your service levels. You can have more product in your DC than you can at all of your um, satellite branches or your, your spoke branches. So uh, when any demand um, pops up at any one of those satellite branches, that demand can be fulfilled from the central warehouse uh, the next day, or the likelihood that it can be uh, is a lot higher than they would be able to set, satisfy that from themselves uh, ordering directly from the supplier. And the way uh, a central warehouse uh, software application can help uh, manage where the inventory needs to go uh, is again looking at demand across the entire network, all of the the um, satellite locations, aggregating that, accounting for lead times between that DC and those satellite locations, and incorporating those into the uh, order point or sorry the line point as far as when uh, that material needs to be acquired and brought into the central warehouse to be available to satisfy demand at any of the satellite. Uh, locations. And an example of um, where you know the, the central warehouse concept can really benefit um, uh, a company, um, HVAC or plumbing distributor, when a and this happens probably more frequently than people would like, and a contractor orders something. Um, the satellite branch, uh, local branch, brings it in, has it available. The customer come pick up, contractor ultimately cancels that order, and now that inventory is is sitting there unproductive. And over time, it might uh, become one of those dying or, or dead um, items, 
to be dealt with, but in a central warehousing environment or model, it can immediately be identified as surplus inventory and among uh, at that particular branch brought back or suggested to be transferred back to the central warehouse and repurposed, either sent back to the supplier or moved to another um, uh, spoke warehouse that could benefit from that demand um, of that item. Uh, and the, uh, the last point I'll make about uh, you know, central warehouse model for a region is the investment for automation is very easy or easier to justify when you have that increased volume. So when you're bringing a whole geographic region of locations or multiple branches into a central distribution center, then you can justify the investment in making that distribution center more uh, automated, more efficient at picking and packing and taking care of those um, logistics operations due to the increased volume um, that you have coming from the whole network. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, Tony, I'm going to throw this question your way. Doesn't central warehousing create added transportation costs versus keeping inventory at each branch? Ruth, thanks. Uh, and I think that's debatable. I mean, sure, there's going to be costs for your trucks to go from branch to branch, right? So running, running that truck fleet for transfers, there is going to be a cost. But as Justin mentioned, there's going to be or potentially reduction in the inbound cost from vendors because you're going to buy better. So that cost of running the trucks will be offset. And then there's the other factor that in a perfect world, you'd have every item just in time for every customer in the right quantity, right? But the key there is in a perfect world. The reality would be there'll be exceptions. There'll be a customer doing work in a branch you didn't anticipate. So there's an item they need they, that's never been sold there. There'll be unusual demand. There'll be other situations where you have to transfer an item to a location. And I think that goes to the distinction between stock transfers where you're trying to stock a location and order-based transfers, a term a lot of people use when you're, it's for a specific customer order. Uh, anytime you have multiple locations, you're inevitably going to do order-based transfers where you need something for a customer. So since you're going to be running that truck anyway, why not use it for those stock transfers? You also want to look for a system, and we're not necessarily advocating that every location gets every item or every line from the central distribution center. There'll be situations where you're selling enough or buying enough of a product or a product line in a location where you're going to get that directly from the manufacturer. That always makes sense. But you'll have smaller lines where that outlying branch is not meeting minimum anyway. You can meet minimum out of the central distribution and just transfer it when you need to be it, right? That's interesting points. Interesting points. Um, let's now talk about a wireless warehouse. Uh, Justin, I'll start with you. Uh, what is Wireless Warehouse, and what is its benefit to inventory optimization? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ruth. Uh, wireless Warehouse is uh, arming your warehouse personnel with a mobile computer. So um, as your people, your warehouse team, are out there performing functions in, in handling your, your physical inventory, whether that's uh, receiving, put away, picking, replenishing locations, moving between locations, um, or cycle counting, physical counting. They're, they're touching the inventory, and Wireless Warehouse is uh, uh, providing that user who's touching your inventory, which is your <laughs> largest asset, um, with a computer that not only helps guide them but it, in what they need to do, it also can track what they do, uh, and all of that information visibility uh, gets recorded to the benefit of your entire operations. So as a distributor, knowing what is on hand and what is available is such a powerful um, number to have trust in. So that cost, that, that soft cost that you just often can't see when somebody calls to the warehouse and says, can you check the shelf? Do we have this amount on there? That's an expense that you don't want to have to incur. So a wireless warehouse solution can eliminate that by providing accuracy 
that any time a product is brought in, moved, or pulled, or taken out, relieved, it's done using that mobile computer, that, that device, and by that warehouse person, so that uh, very quickly that accuracy level of what you have um, is trusted and becomes relied upon. So your salespeople are confident when they're selling that item. When your e-commerce site is listing what you have, it can list to your customers, you have that amount and you're confident that it'll be there. And then um, related is accuracy in servicing your customers. The, the confidence that um, you're actually picking the right product to fulfill an order um, and delivering that to the customer the first time rather than them getting it and saying, no, this isn't the correct item and having to deal with the return and processing and reshipping. And that's an, an extra cost that if you can bring that down substantially, which Wireless Warehouse does, simply by having a computer validate through a barcode scan that, in fact, that is the item that was ordered. Uh, it's not relying on a human to read and identify the part and confirm that, yes, in fact, it is the, the correct part. Um, it's done by a computer. And while I'll grant that it may be a second faster to simply reach into a bin and grab an item and run, um, as opposed to having to do a scan of that, that extra second to confirm it is, in fact, the correct item and it's recorded what time they did it, how long it took them, um, will save you uh, uh, immensely in the long run. And then um, productivity is the other benefit to a distributor. Um, and I'll just mention kind of one, one thing where you might question the productivity. The productivity of your warehouse um, team moving around the warehouse, just defining the best way for them to walk through the warehouse the, the, when they're picking or putting away or cycle counting material, um, having them, uh, you know, seventy percent of time spent in a warehouse is spent walking. So if you can improve and have a, a device telling them go to this location, then make this pick, then make this pick, then make this pick, and that improves their their steps walked, uh, even a small percentage over what they would do uh, without that guidance. Um, you're going to save yourself uh, on uh, on costs. And the um, the final point I'll make is that the um, distributors often find that the need to have product knowledge in their warehouse, knowing what the items are, uh, is significantly reduced, if not eliminated. So the the uh, cost to main, retain and uh, train your warehouse personnel so that they know what item they're picking, they know where it is, that can go away. And having a device, they go to this location, pick this item, and it's all going to be validated through a computer uh, means you, you, you can rely on, on less uh, skilled, less highly trained, and therefore less expensive uh, labor force. Thank you, Justin. Tony, care to add anything about this? It's tough to add anything with the great way Justin answered, but if I could stress one thing, to me, the, the best part of it is syncing the warehouse shelves with the computer system and timing. And a great example is, you know, cycle counting. In most systems, if you're not using the wire, a wireless system, in order to cycle count, you have to freeze an aisle or freeze a section, or you could, I've seen people try and count an aisle while people are picking, and that creates a problem, right? So I'm, I'm counting this aisle, and people are picking, and what's been picked and what's not by kind of syncing that timing and putting the shelf in exactly the same time. And one of, one of the hurdles for some distributors is you have to get to the mindset that a product doesn't move until you scan it, right? So you not necessarily can't have salespeople walking in the warehouse with a pick ticket grabbing an item, right? Nope, you have to scan it. When you can get in that timing, though, what that allows you to do is you can cycle count during the day. And to the point that Justin said about the confidence when you can cycle count during the day and when you can get to that confidence level, when everybody starts believing in the count in the warehouse, people stop going to the warehouse to check, they're more confident on the phone, and then you start eliminating errors because of the confidence in the system. So they all go hand in hand. Thank you, Tony. Um, gentlemen, this question is for both of you. 
Please tell us how Epicor can help a distributor optimize their inventory to eliminate costs from their supply chain and streamline processes. Yeah, this is Justin. I'll, I'll go first. And uh, I think as we've highlighted today in, in a lot of the, the demand forecasting and, and the replenishment, software and the computer, um, and, and so Epicor being a supplier of that software um, that runs on computers, has a, a, an immense amount of power to watch and you know, see every entry of demand, see every movement of, of physical goods, and, you know, track every dollar, but um, analyze, you know, look for those patterns, identify um, where action is required and support you in taking those actions and inform the people. That, that I'm not advocating that, that software and Epicor software is a replacement for um, the, the people that, that run and know your customers and, and uh, operate your business. Um, so uh, a buyer, a purchasing agent, you know, they, they still know that uh, a particular uh, event, a weather event is coming, and then more inventory needs to be, be brought in, for example. But with the software providing knowledge, um, numbers, helping take away the, those uh, tough decisions and providing statistical arrived at numbers, they're empowered to do their job better and potentially with less of them as, as an owner. Tony, what are your thoughts? Yeah, if I weigh in on that and just to kind of touch what's on the slide is, and, and Justin, you know, mentioned this, you know, what we do here at Epicor is we provide tools for wholesale distributors to help them run their business. You know, those tools are fit for purpose for wholesale distributors. And the reason we do that is we've got 45 years of experience here and roughly 4,000 customers across the country. So, you know, we get a tremendous amount of feedback on them on what they need those tools to be. Those tools are designed to be easy to use, easy to learn, easy to implement. And again, if, if they're not easy to use, our, our distributor customers will certainly let us know. And at the end of the day, all the tools and the things that Justin and I talked around today are designed to help you grow your business. And we can look at growth a lot of different ways. It's, you know, grow sales, improve margins, but it's also improve efficiency, improve turns, you know, have the right inventory at the right time. So the goal is to really, at the end of the day, help you get more out of your business using those tools we provide. Thank you, gentlemen. A great information. Uh, I'm going to Take this time now to open it up for Q&A here uh, from our, our audience. And, you know, we've got some great questions that are coming through the line here. Um, so, gentlemen, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to read them out loud and jump in uh, when you would like to. The first question is: Is forecasting something you need to turn on for all items? We have some items that we'd like to control manually. Hey, hey Ruth, this is Tony. If I could take that one, um, Justin can certainly weigh in. Uh, you know, I can't speak for all systems out there, but from my experience, most systems will let you turn on that forecasting selectively so you don't have to turn on, you know, even a whole vendor's line, let alone your entire inventory. What we typically recommend if you're used to using something that's min-max, why don't you just learn with a smaller line, to so take a small line or a portion of a line, and then start working with the tool and start using that forecasting. And, and because typically there's lots of parameters involved, like what are your settings for safety stocks, so on and so forth. So you might not have that set correctly. So start with a small line, use it as a learning experience, and then keep moving on to a larger and larger vendor line until eventually you've got all or most of your inventory where you're doing a, you know, an online forecasting of that. Excellent. Uh, another question that just came in, we've always used MinMax since it's simple to understand. How difficult would it be to go to the dynamic methods and use formulas like order point and line point? Yeah, Ruth, this is Tony. I'll take that again. Um, so it's um, that, another interesting question. It, it, I don't think it's difficult. It's it's just, a, I, I think of it as a mind shift, right? It's just changing the way you think about doing your buying. And the key is that helped me the first time I really learned it years ago was, you know, going down, and I'm old school, the way I remember things is to write it down. So I had to go in and 
write down the order point formula, write down the EOQ formula, write down the line point formula. And the reason is when I, you turn those things on in the system and the system will turn back a number that's your order point or your you know, economic order quantity, you're going to initially question it and go, wow, how did the system come up to that? Uh, you know, a great system will actually tell you how the math was derived. You can see that. But knowing what that formula is, this way you can go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And it gives you an extra level of confidence. It'll also remind you on where, you know, what switch. Like, again, the safety stock. Maybe you've got safety stock set for 90 days of supply versus 30, and that'll change all the calculation off of that. So, again, it's something where there's, there's some learning involved, some education. Uh, maybe, you, you know, hopefully your system's got an online education tool. We have that here at Epicor. We have Epicor University where there's online training tools where you can take that. But there'll be some education to understand how the formula is derived and then some tests and trying to make sure you have all the settings right going forward. You had talked about training and a question popped in and this might tie into it. Um, a question is the training on RF use is limited on the Epicor training site. Are there any plans to update or improve what's available? Uh, and, uh, hi Ruth, this is Justin. I'll, I'll field that one. The, um, uh, what we have found at individual warehouses over the years is that there's um, there's differences between physical, you know, multi uh, levels, mezzanines, multi building yards, different product mix, different um, profile mix. So we um, have a, a methodology when an Epicor customer is looking to implement uh, the RF WMS in the mobile a wireless warehouse to come in and do an audit and, and work with them and review their operations and uh, identify what is the best technique that they can use for not only organizing their warehouse, but then implementing those mobile computers in their activities. So um, I, the, we tailor the processes and the procedures to uh, best fit the operations and the productivity and, and objectives that each site is seeking to get. Got it. Thank you, Justin. Uh, another question, uh, and that is, what is a good way to identify a dead or dying product SKU description so the sales staff is aware of it during the sales order entry? Yeah, and I can I can and take that. Is, yeah, and get it. There's a couple ways you could do that. I mean, one thing is you can set up a category of items. You know, so you have an actual item category called, you know, dead or dying. So you can you could search that. Uh, other ways, if your system doesn't have that category, you know, just adding that word someplace into an extended description, something you're not typically printing on forms, right? By uh, keyword, extended description, alternate search field. Again, depending on what system you're on, uh, you, you want to be more proactive sometimes with that. I always think of a dead or a dying item. I want to find somebody who's bought it in the past and reach out to them proactively. So I don't want to wait for them to call me to say they need something else or more of that. I want to call, you know, Justin and say, hey, three months ago, Justin, you bought 37 of these. I've got 20 more on the shelf. Can I work you a deal? So, you know, your system should have ways to pull that out in some type of um, inquiry. And if you don't provide a report, you know, the the, the largest you know, inventory level of dying items in which customers are bought in and just get a, a BDR business development rep or telemarketing person on the phone calling into those customers trying to drive some sales out of that. Excellent. Another great question is, uh, do you have investment buying functionality? As an example, a supplier is increasing prices and we can lock in the purchase now instead of later. But is the is it the right equipment to buy? This is Justin. I'll I'll, I'll take that. In there's uh, and it was uh, spoken about a little, little earlier. The return on added investment functionality does allow the buyer to put in those um, those variables of what. Um, I, I mentioned it was a promo, uh, but it could just as e easily be a, a future cost that um, can help the buyer determine this is a, a good opportunity and an item that we should stock based on demand uh, and this additional investment. Thank you, Justin. Um, 
another one, another question here de deals on central warehousing. Is it possible to only do central warehousing for some items? We have some vendors we can purchase direct and some that would be better if we bought centrally. I thought central warehousing was all or nothing at all. This is Justin, I'll take that. The, uh, it is not, it does not need to be. Um, and it, again, the, the software would um, dictate what your options are, but in general, central warehousing is something you wanna do when it makes sense. So certainly slower moving items, um, and you know if you can uh, all the things we talked about earlier with the acquisition cost if you're buying truckloads of, of pallets uh, and your volume uh, it, it would make sense to have those shipped direct um, to every location and not centrally warehouse that inventory and that might be on an individual item basis might be on a supplier basis depending on what their terms are uh, in how they um, fulfill your, your purchase orders so um, Absolutely, central warehousing is something that you can analyze and implement uh, line by line or even item by item. Thank you. Uh, another question that came in here is, what is the best way to calculate safety stock? Yeah, just Tony, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, there's, well, there's, you know, we could probably spend a, a whole day on that topic. Uh, to me, I mean, the, the two main ways you can do it is, a manual way where you're looking at a, a certain quantity. Um, so you think back, you know, to the, you know, think about, you know, when I had milk for my son, how many, the quantity I had, right? So money system would just have you put a quantity in. More advanced systems will allow you to put a number of days supply or a number of months supply. And what that'll happen is if you're doing forecasting and you come up with what you're going to use on a regular basis and you want to keep seven days supply on the shelf, that quantity will increase or decrease based upon that forecasting, right? So really you want to get away from using a fixed quantity. It would be a little bit different on anything that's erratic, right? You have erratic items where it's more difficult to forecast. You know, you, you want to, you know, you know you always sell two of a certain product, they come in pairs, maybe you want to do that manually. So it's figuring out the difference between erratic items and items you can forecast. Thank you for that, Tony. I believe, you know, we've covered some great topics here and some great questions have come in um, from the group. Uh, this now is going to, unless there's any other um, items you'd like to talk about, Tony or Justin, I, I think that we're pretty much done here. And folks will be able to uh, listen to the webinar again by going to epicor.com. So any last comments, gentlemen? I just want to thank everybody for giving us the time today and their busy schedule. Yep, thank you all. I appreciate you attending. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Again, for more information, please visit www.epicor.com. Have a great day.